Hello, everybody. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. This is one of the like, really exciting opportunities a, a, a wonderful community have gathered today. Thank you for showing up today. We've got about 33 participants right now, and we're so honored to have Michelle Mijun Kim with us um, in our book club that's passed by Margaret Park. Um, so welcome. The first, um, on to the next slide, I would like to invite everybody to think about, um, as you are coming in, what is an impactful word, phrase, or sentence, and or new learning or unlearning you have from the wake up? I'd like you to type it in the chat and then introduce yourself as well and tell us where you are signing in from. So if I were to type it in the chat, for me, on page 35 of the book, The Wake Up, this the freight with the question, who does or why actually serve is something that is impactful for me. And I'm going to type in my name in there. So please feel free to do that at the webinar chat um, right now. Thank you, Liz. Can't transform the world without transforming yourself. Thank you for adding it in the chat. So feel free to keep on keep on adding as we go along. And as we move on to the next um, slide, Margaret will walk us through today's learning flow. Okay, so today we're going to do a welcome and quick check in. Um, thanks, Joel. Um, we're going to have a grounding purpose and partnership. Um, Joel is then going to give some introductions. Um, and we're also going to provide um, a link for you to submit your questions. So as uh, Michelle speaking, if there's something that impresses you or something that you find insightful or are wondering you have, please feel free to add that um, in the link that will be shared um throughout the session um and then we'll have a dialogue and um, when we were co-planning we were going to invite the audience to come in and community with us and ask, ask questions directly so you'll get a chance to unmute yourself and um, speak with michelle directly so we're really excited about that uh going on to the next slide Liz, Liz, on to you. Hello, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to be here today. And I want to, um, so I'm Liz Duffy. I'm president of International School Services. And I have to say to um, Michelle Bajon Kim that I love reading this book. Thank you for um, all the wisdom that you've um, shown through this book. I also want to thank um, Margaret and Joel for putting this series together. It's been um, just a pleasure to work with you and to be prompted and, and provoked um, by the good questions that you guys have raised throughout this book series. Um, and then I want to recognize the sponsors of this um, book group. So Joel, if you could turn to the next page. All right, that would be great. Um, so the first one is what's called the ISS Marianne Haas Women's Symposium. It's it's named after the woman who founded this women's symposium 21 years ago, Marianne Haas, which you can see from the pictures here, she's actually 97 now. Um, she's quite a character and really an inspiration. And she founded the Women's Symposium 21 years ago to increase the number of women leaders in international schools. And we continue to do um, professional development for women and for others. Um, so this is, they were one of the hosts of this. Um, the next host is, if you could, next slide is ALOC, um, who we have been pleased to partner with over the um, last six years, and they actually are turning six tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken, it's either today or tomorrow. Um, but they're an organization, which I know many of you know, who are basically to de dedicated to amplifying the voice of international educators and leaders of color. And I can personally say I've learned a ton from them over the last six years. And um, I know they've made a real difference in the international school sector. So we're thrilled to have them as the host of today's book group too. And then Joel is gonna talk a, lot of, a little bit about ISS, which is the third host for today or the third sponsor. Yeah, so thanks, Liz. Thanks, Margaret. Um, really today, one of the um, 
conversations we had is that the book club is part of our capacity building. And it's really a lot around align in alignment with our commitment with international school services is really supporting diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. Um, to the next slide, please. Thanks, Malefe. And it's very much aligned to the IS's core values as well around making a world of difference. You will notice that we've got six core values and center to that is advocating for diversity, inclusion and equity. But at the same time, it's also impacting the other core values that we have doing the right thing, championing learning, engaging the global community, striving for excellence and caring for all. Yeah. To the next slide. And apart from that, that's also manifested in the many services that we offer within International School Services, and that includes the school startup and management, professional development um, through our ISS EduLearn Passport, our teacher recruitment, our leadership search. We also have consultancy around accounting and finance, as well as school supplies. One of the output as well of the work on diversity collaborative is really centered around the sustainable development goals and DEIJ created by the advocacy committee of diversity collaborative and these are some of those specific outcomes that we hope to be able to have in international education through the work of this collective um, diversity collaborative ALOC the women's symposium um, and um, the international school services And this book club is an enabler for outcome. And this is a community learning together. Initially, it was hosted internally within ISS as part of our learning. But at the same time, we are opening it up because we're so thrilled to have Michelle Mijan Kim with joining us. And so this is around building our collective leadership capacity to nurture caring, critical and courageous change making in our communities that are grounded in these essential components, building and empowering anti-racist communities, taking action to create healing practices and spaces, demonstrating and increasing equity literacy, valuing diverse voices, people, and ideas, and as well as nourishing and sustaining inclusive communities that nurture a sense of belonging. And so at this point, I am so honored to introduce to you two amazing, incredible leaders in, in our community. We have with us our facilitator for this book club, Margaret Park, is a diversity, equity, inclusion consultant who works with organizations to make positive changes for all community members. She is the former elementary school assistant principal at Seoul Foreign School and is currently on the advisory council of the Association of International Educators and Leaders of Color. Margaret is committed to fostering leadership development with experience in facilitating professional development, training leadership teams, counseling, mentoring, coaching, and curating innovative learning spaces. Margaret is a Fulbright Scholar and received an Education Master's Certificate of Advanced Studies from Harvard Graduate School of Education. She also holds an Education Master's in Childhood General and Special Education from Hunter College. Margaret is a NETCAL Fellow and a member of the Council of Korean Americans. Margaret is particularly interested in thinking about leadership through an equity and justice lens. It is also my honor to introduce to you our guest speaker today, the author of The Wake Up, um, Michelle Nijong Kim, is a queer immigrant Korean American woman navigating this world as a writer, an activist, an entrepreneur. And she is also a speaker, a facilitator, and a consultant, and have worked with organizations and leaders across all industries, from tech giants to nonprofits, to government agencies, to universities. And if I may add now, it's going to be with international education in order to spark lasting and meaningful change. Um, Michelle's work, regardless of its form, is about expanding our collective capacity to transform ourselves and the world in service of social justice. She believes that we can do this by learning to be a values-aligned relationship with each other and being willing to drop into discomfort, complexity, and accountability uh, for ourselves and others to create sustainable change. Um, she believes all of us are worthy of safety, dignity, freedom, and joy for simply being. Um, without further ado, I'm going to pass you on to Margaret Park and Michelle Mijong Kim. Thank you so much, Joel. And thank you, Joel. Thank you. And I'll give a quick shout out to Molly Faye and Mike, who's running the tech for these sessions. It's really important. So thank you, team. Um, it's such an honor to be here today. Michelle, thank you so much for being in this space today. We are all so thrilled to be learning with you. Um, so we're just going to get started. Um, we're going to start with... Um, the why. And um, in chapter two, 
Um, you shared the most sustaining why is the one that directly involves ourself. It is one rooted not in our desire to help others from a place of distance, but in our understanding that we each play a critical role in upholding and dismantling systemic oppressions that impact all of us. And so can you share um, a little bit about why it's important to know your why and any yeah. other thoughts you have surrounding that? Yeah, yeah of course. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me and for engaging with my book in this meaningful way. I am truly beyond honored to be here and to be in conversation with all of you. Um, and I am just so grateful reading through some of the quotes that you all are posting in the chat, understanding what resonated. Um, and I have so much respect and appreciation for the work that you all do as educators and folks in education. Um, and I, I just I just want to start with that gratitude. And Margaret and Joel, y'all have been so thoughtful throughout this entire um, organization of this event. So I really appreciate you both. Um, the why, it is probably one of the most foundational chapters of my book. Uh, and uh, hopefully for those of you who've been able to read it, um, some of those things uh, sparked questions um, that we can all ask ourselves uh, individually and as a collective. I start with the why often because the number one question I get from people who want to create change in their organizations and their spheres of influence is, what can I do? Tell me what to do, right? We get so many of those questions from people who want to immediately go to the action stage, which is understandable in a productivity-driven society that we have all been brought up in. Um, so we've been trained to crave these one, two, three checklists because they make us feel good. They make us feel useful right in the moment. And we expect to see what we do today impacting change by tomorrow. Um, and I think this appetite for immediate change and urgency is something that I think we need to be really aware of, especially when we're engaging work that is supposed to be about unlearning the cultures and characteristics of white supremacy culture that demands that we go out and act with the expectation of urgency and immediacy <clears throat> without regard to the foundation or the relational aspect of this work. Um, so for me, when we get to interrogate the why, that's what informs the what. Without the why, we cannot expect to be on the same or even aligned paths as we move forward. So when we get when we have a much more grounded why, that gets to inform the what as well as the how. So I think that is the importance of beginning with the why. So many people that I work with, you know, I, most of my work focused on for-profit organizations who would use the business case as their why. You know, we want more diversity. We want more inclusion because that is what produces the most profit. That is what helps build more um, innovative companies because there has been research that backs that up, which I think was a, a useful entry point when at a time um, there wasn't much interest in investing in social justice work. But over time, what I am observing is that that is not a sustainable why that we can hold ourselves to because the immediate ROI may never come. And then that's become, that becomes the first thing that people drop when the revenue decreases and so on and so forth, which is what we're seeing, at least in the United States with the mass layoffs that are happening. Um, the, the departments that are being impacted are often folks who are on the front lines doing work for equity and justice. And ultimately, what I argue in the book is that we cannot expect social justice outcomes to come from a why rooted in capitalism. And then the second why that many of us are familiar with is this notion of it's just the right thing to do. And it's my you know, moral duty to help those who are less fortunate than me, which I think has a uh, you know, much more of a humane um, reasoning behind rather than the business case. But I call this the unsustainable why, because this why depends solely on our own goodwill, that we are doing this out of the goodness of our hearts. And so when we are met with obstacles or challenges, um, it's going to be a real pressure test in terms of our willingness to do the right thing. Um, it also creates this false distance between the systems of oppression that we're looking to dismantle and ourselves, right? That we see ourselves as objective, neutral third parties who are going in to help those 
quote unquote, less fortunate than I, um, rather than really seeing ourselves as part of the systems of oppression we're trying to dismantle. So it creates this false dynamic of um, saviorism, right? Putting ourselves on pedestals in places uh, where we get to be good people, saving others, rendering this important work as charity work rather than work that we all have responsibility to do because of our place in it. Um, then that leads me to the third why that I call the most sustainable why, which is the one that involves ourselves. It's the one that recognizes that we all are complicit in one way or another in upholding systems of oppression at the same time that we are being harmed by it. And for me, you know, really making this uh, uh, practical for people was really important for me because it's, it's we hear quotes like, um, our liberation is bound together, but I think it's really those stories and the, the examples that people need to hear to understand how these different systems of oppressions are interlocking and how they impact people with different identities. So for example, I always talk about how I want men to care about dismantling the patriarchy and the misogyny, not only because they care about the women in their lives, but because they understand that it's the same force that's robbing them of their ability to be vulnerable in society or their ability to stay at home with their kids without penalty. I want cisgender people to care about transphobia and dismantling that, not just because they have trans friends, but also because they understand that it's the same force that's locking us into restrictive gender roles and gender expressions. And I want white people to want to dismantle racism, not only because they have people of color friends and colleagues, but because they understand that white supremacy is robbing them of their humanity too. So when we get to see ourselves in these issues that we are partaking in, I think we can have a much more honest and earnest journey together rather than coming from a position of superiority or saviorism or positioning ourselves as a one dimensional good person so that this work becomes much more sustainable for a longer period of time and we can build much more ground of solidarity together. Thank you so much, Michelle. I know a lot of us are taking notes and try processing all these nuggets of wisdom. Um, I had a follow up question about the why for you. Mm -hmm. So when did you start intentionally uh, thinking about your why? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, I think for me, that's changed over time because I think I started my journey because of the impact that it had on me. So my entryway into the conversations around social justice was one, um, being part of conversations around women's rights, which when I was in high school was very much, I mean, it's, it resembles a lot of the conversations we're having today, minus the, the nuance and the complexity back then for me was, you know, um, being able to fight against anti-abortion laws. And, and then when I came out in high school as being queer, I started understanding all of these different ways that people who are queer and trans are oppressed. So my entryway to this work was understanding the ways in which I am oppressed because I hold these marginalized identities. And of course, the, it, the experiences of being an immigrant, being uh, a person of color in this country, growing up low income, all of these things impact the way that I viewed um, how I was being treated in the world. It wasn't until later when I started really engaging in this work and the work of Kimberly Crenshaw, intersectionality, where I began to really grapple with um, why it is that I need to shift the framing beyond, you know, the, I'm doing this because it impacts my lived experience and uncovering some of the experiences that I haven't lived, but that are also experienced by other systems of oppression, right? So for me, you know, for example, Black Lives Matter, like it was really important for me to understand what is my personal tie to that movement beyond having Black people that I care about in my life and seeing this injustice play out, but really interrogating where is the root of connection? Um, where does our uh, root, the, where, where do the roots of our oppression connect between anti-Asian racism and anti-Black racism? And being able to, to see those connections and where the dots connect, I think really helped me to see that none of us is fighting separate fights. So 
unless we have those intertwined complex whys that help us understand how when we march for one group, we're also marching for all others. I think that was really the turning point for me around having the sustainable why that wasn't just going to be about me fighting my own battle in a silo. Mm -hmm. So it's taken some time to evolve. (laughs) Um, And who knows, it may evolve again in the future around how I think about the why. But, you know, I think this has been the journey that I also witness in other people that we often come to the work through our own lived experiences and our lenses. And then we get to, you know, wake up (laughs) to other people's um, suffering. And then we have that third layer of waking up to ourselves and our complicity and our connection to other systems of oppression. Thank you for sharing parts of your story. Um, This actually is a good segue to the next question, which is about storytelling. Um, So how do you see storytelling being leveraged as a form of transformation and healing? Um, Thank you for that question. And by the way, should we get rid of the slide so we can just be in conversation? That would be great. There you go. Yay. Thank you, Mike. Um, Storytelling. So scientifically, you know, getting really practical, stories are the best and fastest ways that we train our brains to learn something new. Um, So I think there is a proven effectiveness and efficacy around using stories to educate people. Um, But then for me, I think what gets me really frustrated about doing this work is how often the work of social justice or DEI become hyper-intellectualized without any remnants of humanity in it, right? So when people ask me about the best practices or the frameworks or people's I light up when there is a new McKinsey study or BCG study around the latest diversity trends and blah, 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 blah. And I think that was the, the, the kinds of um, cognitive dissonance that I felt going from social justice grassroots work to the corporate space where diversity was being talked about in this hyper-intellectualized way, where it was actually replicating the same patterns of violence, of commodifying this work and commodifying the people who are in this work. Mm-hmm. Um, and so for me, I use storytelling as a way to humanize this work to breathe back in that humanity that's so important for us to remember, because at the end of the day, this work is about human lives. This is about all of our collective trauma. This is about all of our reclaiming of our humanity. So I think storytelling is such an essential part of this work, because how can we do this work without putting the people at the center of it? And I think there is tremendous amount of healing that so many marginalized people experience when they get to resonate with one another's stories, that my lived experiences is not in isolation, that I am not the one, I'm I'm not the only one experiencing this types of violence or harm in this world, and that we are in this together through sharing our lived experiences. So I think it's also a tool for our collective reclaiming of our narratives that are so often flattened in the world, as well as our way of connecting one another so that we can heal together by being and by bearing witness to one another's stories. So yeah, storytelling is such an important critical part of this work. And I hope that we remember um, that really ultimately this work is about our healing. So how would you create space for storytelling in your personal life and professional life? We have a lot of um, educators and school leaders on this call. Do you have any suggestions for that? Um, I mean, I think there are so many ways that we naturally incorporate storytelling in our day to day, right? When we meet someone for the first time being really curious about their stories beyond what got them here, right? So when, um, it's funny because when we do our introductions, there are a lot of like fancy credentialing (laughs) that happens. Like, oh, you went to Harvard, you know? I'm like, oh, I went, I worked with all these tech companies. Um, And I think that's part of what we are so used to wearing these masks 
and uh, you know leading with these credentials because that's how we prove our worthiness and that's how we prove our value in a society that's been so trained to look for those things and then we forget the universe of stories that we've lived and uh, as educators the greatest tool we have is curiosity and that also includes people that we are in community with because that informs the way that we learn together you know and i i'm sure many of you are familiar with um the ways in which uh, expanding the scope of concern for our students impact the way that we teach and that's the same thing with adults and adult students and or adult learners when we expand the scope of concern or even employees of workplaces when we can expand the scope of concern to really understand the full and whole humanity of someone and the types of factors that impact the way that they exist in this world, then we get to be able to support each other in a much more nuanced way rather than one that is very myopic. Um, so I think there are many ways that we can incorporate each other's storytelling into the classroom or beyond whether it is the workplace or our neighborhood or our whatever individual spheres of influence we're part of to be able to get curious about one another one another's stories and then i also talk about for those of you who have been able to um read the chapter on the hidden stories right i think part of the work is our understanding of our own holistic stories that is much more expansive than the stories that we tell ourselves. So I think there's multiple different entryways to engaging with the art of storytelling, um, starting from you understanding your own story and then being curious about one another's. Yeah, I really appreciate what you said about you know, curiosity um, is the greatest tool we have as educators. I think oftentimes we, we want our students to be curious about things or, or concepts, um, but really getting curious about people. So encouraging, you know, um, leaders and educators on this call today, you know, how are we, um, you know, fostering that curiosity for people? And um, a step further, um, Michelle mentioned hidden stories. The chapter is fabulous. Um, how do we get our students to um, like be curious about themselves? Um, yeah. And so, yeah, thank you for um, sharing those wisdoms, the, the gems again. Um, so our next question um, is about um, the sections of your book. Uh, we're curious to learn about um, why you sectioned it off in four parts. So there was mm -hmm. part one, grounding, part two, orienting, part three, showing up, part four, moving together. Um, can you walk us through this framework? And yeah. again, why, you know, why you chose uh, that, uh, those sectionings? Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes people ask me how, if I knew exactly how I wanted to write the book, um, and the answer is absolutely not. <laughs> I found out that I'm a much more chaotic writer <laughs> who writes just everything that I am thinking in my brain, just dumping it all out and then trying to make sense of it afterwards. So I did not start with this framework. Um, you know, I, I, I wasn't that brilliant to be able to come up with this framework and then look at it and then write it in chronological order. Um, it was after I had written way too many words um, and started editing and trimming it down and placing things that I was able to see this arc that was so um, intuitive for me um, as someone who's been doing this work in different spheres for a very long time. Um, and I begin the, the book with um, this question, this inquiry, uh, that's based in my experience of gathering people who are all well-intentioned and trying to do this work together. And uh, the things that I continue to observe in these spaces, whether it was workshops or organizing spaces or extracurricular spaces that people were in because they are personally in, uh, interested or uh, invested in seeing DEI justice and positive change happen. Um, what I continue to observe in these spaces was that while we all get there with the same intentions, we don't actually know how to be with each other. That there is, despite the good intentions, there is harm, that there is stumbling. And then when the stumbling happens in that 
communal setting that there is residual ripple effects that impact the group dynamics that lead to disappointment, that lead to people checking out of the work because they're so frustrated that this other person just harmed me and they're not taking responsibility and they're not getting it. Or there's microaggressions without realizing. And then people say, but I have good intentions. I'm just trying to be a part of the work. So there are so many ways that these groups that get together for um, the, the purpose of creating change actually em, end up imploding or disintegrate because they themselves cannot practice the values in an embodied way. Mm. So the question that I asked in the beginning of the book is, if simply denouncing social injustices is not enough to connect you and me, then what does? So for me, it was about understanding what is the connective tissue that's missing. So how do we actually move together with the same set of values and principles, even if you don't know all the right words to say, and I'm putting that in air quotes, um, even if you don't know the right words to say, how can we align in the spirit and the principle of this work so that we can move together to create real solidarity beyond transactional allyship? So I begin then with not moving together, but grounding ourselves. How do we get grounded in our why? So that when we go out to do this work, we are reminded of the why, because this work gets really messy, can get really difficult, really frustrating and disappointing. So unless we have a foundational why and the way that we approach this work, this is going to become an exhausting work and what people will sometimes think of as thankless work uh, very quickly. Then we move into orienting. There is a lot of context that we weren't taught in schools. What is the context to which we need to orient ourselves in order for us to understand that this is not just about creating diversity for diversity's sake, but there is centuries of historical information that we may not even be aware of that we need to first get oriented to or while we are trying to uh, contribute to this work. So that's the chapter around, you know, white supremacy culture. What do I mean by that? And what's the historical um, uh, ramifications of some of the things that have happened in this, particularly in the U.S., but also more broadly, um, the impacts around the globe and how the context is so important in order for us to create adaptive solutions to different situations. And then the third part is showing up. This is what some people will think of as a little bit more tactical um, and uh, applications of how we are, you know, uh, understanding certain principles, right? For me, it was important for important for me to teach people how to fish rather than giving them the to-do list and checklist that can expire by next cycle of whatever cultural phenomenon that um, happens, right? The list of faux pas will always change, but as long as we can have the same ground of principles, I wanted people to be able to maneuver different change in context with these principles. So whether it is how we think about language, right? Or how we think about apologizing and taking accountability. These are all the different tools that we can learn so that we can apply them to different situations. And then lastly is a reminder around community because we can't do this work alone or in a vacuum. So the, the last sort of final um section of the book is around how we move together with this remembering that we are not doing this work individually and also that we need each other to arrive at our individual as well as our collective healing. Mm. Oh, wow, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, in the, in the, I think in part one, you kind of mentioned about um, unintentional harm and, uh, and, and, you know, having good intentions. Um, but I think we all recognize in this work, just because you have good intention, it doesn't mean the impact is positive. And so the next um, question is about chapter eight, um, which is titled Permission to be Called Out. So it talks about how difficult and uncomfortable it can be to be called in and out. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about why it's so difficult for us to receive feedback and recognize that we are also capable of harming others? Yeah. You know, I think... Um... Oftentimes, I don't think the conversations around the, the, the difficulty of receiving feedback go deeper into the cultural context. So I always like to actually expand the scope 
in which we are talking about accountability. Um, and this is something that I've learned through studying the work of uh, prison abolitionists in the US and um, the work of primarily, you know, black women and women of color who, you know, are so diligent about shedding light in, uh, to shedding light on the conditions that birth violence, right? And uh, um, who teach us to look at the, the conditions that create these behaviors that people engage in, whether it is violence against each other or um, causing harm onto others out of these conditions of necessity and survival. So for me, when I think about why is it so hard for us to receive feedback that we've caused harm or made a mistake, it goes way beyond because it's uncomfortable to how we have been taking cues from our society from a very young age on what happens when we categorize someone as being a bad person. What do we do with bad people in this world? We literally disconnect them from the world. We excommunicate them, we banish them, we hide them away so that we can feel safer in this world. So when we think about the way that we have been trained to think about ourselves and, and the people in the world, it's you're either a good person or you're a bad person. You're either racist or you're not whether you're sexist or not. And we live in this binary thinking world that leaves us no room for mistakes because we know what happens to those bad people. We know as soon as we are seen as racist, there's no coming back from that. But the truth is we can engage in racist behaviors at any given time. I could do something racist, anti-Black, transphobic, ableist at any given time. And I think we need to develop the capacity to be in this messy gray area of seeing ourselves as humans capable of creating harm mm -hmm. at any given moment, but just as much as we are capable of causing harm, that we are also just as capable of redeeming ourselves, taking accountability, learning and doing better, and forgiving ourselves. And so for me, the work of being okay with receiving critical feedback about ourselves is far beyond just creating um, that resiliency from within, but actually looking at the patterns that repeat this, this punitive consequences that people face in this world when they mess up. So it's about us fundamentally believing that every single human being is capable of transforming and that they are worthy of redemption. Mm. And so if we believe in abolition, if we believe in transformative justice, then we also have to be able to practice that in our own lives, within ourselves, and create a culture of proactive accountability where we are not ashamed of our ability to make mistakes, but rather we focus our efforts on how we uh, do better and try to minimize harm, of course, but how can we build the, the capacity for us to be able to sit with ourselves in moments of shame um, and understand that we are all capable of making mistakes and we are capable of taking responsibility for them without completely erasing our entire humanity in the moment. So then that allows us to be able to receive honest feedback because we know that that piece of feedback isn't going to completely destroy our personhood because we are becoming less fragile and more sturdy in the words of Prentice Hemphill. Yeah, I know it, it actually brings me so much joy to think about what you said that we are all as humans, we are all capable of redemption, um, showing grace to each other and we can transform. And so that brings me joy. And that brings uh, us to the next question is, um, how do you experience joy in your life? Um, you know, I, I think I'm still practicing it. <laughs> I think I'm much more used to being resilient and overcoming challenges than really tuning into my own joy. Um, and 
I think this is an important practice that I'm trying to be better at practicing. And one of the things that I remind myself of is um, that part of my ability to access joy and freedom, freedom today is through my healing and through my ability to prioritize my healing. Because for so long, I justified my burnout and exhaustion by saying, well, this is, this is for the movement. I, I know I'm exhausted. I know I'm burnt out, but I was just clawing my way through because how could I not in this dire situation? Um, and so I kept pushing myself. I kept pushing myself. I kept burning out and I was incredibly depressed, incredibly anxious. What I didn't realize I was doing in that moment, in those moments, was how I was making myself expendable in the name of the movement, which is so counter to what we're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. So as much as I would remind people to humanize this work, part of that remembering is the fact that we are doing this work for our collective healing and our ability to live with unabashed joy and freedom in this world. So when we neglect that need, especially as marginalized people, then we are directly contributing to the messaging that we are not worthy of these things, that we are not worthy of rest, that we are not worthy of joy and freedom today. Mm -hmm. And we can't actually wait to prioritize our healing and freedom until all of the systems have been dismantled and we have somehow arrived at this mythical place of collective liberation because that day may never come in our lifetime. So how can we then create this present day joy and moments of freedom and liberation within us? And I think the biggest answer for me has been through community. Mm -hmm. How can we find people who can create that sense of safety for us today, even when these systems are incredibly violent towards us? How can we exercise our values and embody them in such a way that we can allow joy in these moments with one another? Mm. And then I think all of that um, can be also accessed through doing work on our own healing. Um, and I, you know, I want to expand beyond talk therapy because that's something that I've been advocating for a very long time. And I've been in therapy for the last five and a half years. Mm -hmm. Highly recommend. And there are other modalities that I think for, um, especially for people of color and tracing back to our indigenous roots. I think there are so many modalities where we can get in touch with ourselves more because we live in a society where we are separated from head down. We don't feel whatever is below our neck. Um, and I think being able to reclaim that worthiness, the inherent worthiness that we all have, that we're all born with, that we are worthy of joy and freedom and safety at any given time, just by simply being and existing in this world, that reclamation of that narrative and our own innate worthiness, I think is the portal to our being able to experience joy and freedom in the now. Oh, wow. That's such a, um, I don't know what the word is, but such a wonderful encouragement um, for all of us to prioritize our own healing and freedom. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I can give you actually one concrete example of what's giving me joy these days, yeah. because be for so long, um, and for those of you who read the my book and my stories, you know that I'm I was born in South Korea, and part of my um, identity formation in the U.S. when I moved here was by ruthlessly discarding the parts of me that were identified as Korean, whether that was losing my accent, losing my name, losing my, you know, my, one of my, like one of my favorite hobbies was collecting and listening to K-pop from all different eras. And I stopped watching K-dramas. Um, and so it was truly an entire whitewashing of my identity. And so Recently, I've been, since last year, I think, or two years ago, I started re-listening to all my favorite K-pop songs from when I was a teenager. So that's been a source of immense joy. Highly recommend that y'all listen to songs that used to cheer you up when you were a teenager. 
Mm, wow, <laughs> love it. Um, who are some of your favorite K-pop, uh, current K-pop um, artists today? You know, I I am not up to date on the current K-pop folks. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I go like cool. way back to like the days of HOT and SCS for like the original K-pop fans. Um, yeah, I can Thank suggest you. some tunes. <laughs> oh, I love love it. Um, those are the '90s. I love it. Um, so we're going to now transition into the question portion for our audience. So thank you so much for those who have submitted. Uh, you're, all, you're still invited to submit in the link that was shared in the chat. And so we're going to start by um, asking some questions. So Michelle, this is from someone from the audience. Um, thinking back on your own secondary school experience, what do you wish your school or teachers had done differently to support you in your identity formation? Mm. Oh, that's such an important question. Um, oh, so many things. <laughs> so when I came to this country, um, but even I think before that, when I was in elementary school in South Korea, I still remember my third grade teacher who called me into his office, um, who was reviewing my math, the latest math test. Uh, contrary to popular beliefs, I was not good at math, even though I was Asian. Um, in third grade anyway. And uh, I remember the teacher telling me, showing me the test score that was not good and said, you're not very good at math. I would not pursue a career in math if I were you. Mm -hmm. And that stuck with me and gave me what I think people call math anxiety um, for the rest of my life. And combined with the fact that I was a girl, um, combined with the fact that I um, just didn't see myself as being smart, that identity of not being good at math followed me my entire life to this day. Um, and I, I think sometimes we underestimate the impact that adults can have on youth. Um, even just a flip in remark that could stay with someone for the rest of their lives. And on the flip side, you know, in high school, I had a math teacher who really believed in me and I got a really bad score on a test. And instead of telling me that I suck at math, naturally, um, he wrote me a little note saying he believes in me that I could do better next time. Um, and as an immigrant coming to this country, I think there were so many um, jarring moments that I felt um, I was experiencing in isolation, um, whether it was people not understanding not only what was happening in the classroom, but what was happening beyond the, uh, the classroom too, whether it was me being bullied for not being able to speak English or being you know, humiliated in front of a bunch of other kids during lunchtime and how that was impacting the way that I was able to or unable to engage in the classroom. Um, and then systemically too, I grew up low income without access to health insurance. Um, so me not being able to get a doctor's note when I was sick to get an excuse for um, a quiz or a test and not getting a zero on an assignment because I couldn't prove that I was ill like everybody else because I couldn't go to a doctor's office, right? Or requiring a parent to attend certain things when my dad was in uh, working all the time and I didn't have another parent who was present to be able to, you know, walk me through or even attend some of these conferences that my school necessitated for the adults to be involved in. So I Again, I think it's about getting curious about all these contexts that people are coming from and be able to understand that these one dimensional rules cannot apply to everybody who is coming from different contexts, right? Mm -hmm. So these little moments can be incredibly isolating and incredibly scary for young people who are trying to do their best that they can, but without um, the understanding of the adults who are supposed to be in charge of their um, education and growth. So then people feel, and I felt like I was, I had to claw my way into it rather than being invited into the experience of growing together. Um, so I think if we can shift the mindset a little bit to broaden that scope of concern, to really understand what are the conditions that enable folks to learn at their best, 
I think that question alone can result in so many changes, whether it's policy changes or the way that we interact with each other. Mm, thank you. Our next question is about how to approach community members, whether it's family or colleagues who have harmful opinions. Um, the question was specifically about racist comments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, could you respond to that? Yeah, that's such a good question. Um, you know, this is a challenging one because I think we need to understand the layers of layers of uh, the context that the folks are coming from to make that particular comment. So I'll just use my family as an example. Um, in the Asian American community and Korean American community, anti-Blackness is a thing that we have to reckon with. Um, period, full stop. I think there is a lot of work to be done um, within different communities in addressing different forms of violence, whether it's transphobia, homophobia, ableism, anti-Blackness, anti-Asian racism, um, anti-indigeneity. There's so much that people don't um, understand that they have to do work in just because they have a, a marginalized identity as a community. So my experience with trying to connect with my dad, who um, who, who wasn't outright racist <laughs> in his behaviors, but the subtle um, uh, repetition of the rhetoric that was being played out in the media around, you know, how Black people were protesting, how the protests were, were being violent, how we are, you know, um, looking at Black on Black, uh, you know, the, the very harmful rhetoric and racist rhetoric of Black on Black crimes. These were the things that he was repeating. And uh, the way that I um, didn't want to address, and this is something, there's actually a training video that um, me and another uh, facilitator, Kim Tran, Dr. Kim Tran did on how to talk to your Asian family about anti-Blackness on YouTube, it's free. Um, and the thing that we don't want to do is disregard the context that people are coming from and um, uh, go straight to the tactic of shaming. So it wasn't right for me to approach that situation by saying, how dare you, you are, you know, check your privilege, <laughs> right? To my dad who came to this country um, with really no knowledge of the US history, was here undocumented for over 10 years and has his own set of triggers and traumas that color the rhetoric that he believes about the world. Um, what was helpful was addressing how the media can distort stories and narratives about certain groups of people and relating that back to his lived experience mm -hmm. and talking about, hey, do you remember in Korea back in the day when the government used to produce these mass propagandas about people who are protesting for better living conditions and human rights? And him remembering those those days of um, living in, you know, this mass propaganda era and also being a part of those conversations. Um, and there are so many groups that have those stories of pain. So there is actually an entryway to connect and to be able to see and challenge their narratives that are rooted in misinformation or disinformation or pure, pure racism and white supremacy messages. So I think finding ways to connect with their pain is an effective change strategy um, and being able to show, I mean, I'm, and this is very different than someone who is outwardly sort of vehemently trying to be racist, right? Um, I'm not so sure what the strategy is for engaging people who are outright, you know, self-proclaimed neo-Nazis and white supremacists, um, whether it's actually time well spent on trying to change those people's minds versus people who believe that they're not racist, um, but holding up the mirror and letting them see for themselves how their behaviors are actually replicating the harms that they are denouncing. So I think the contexts are very different. I, I don't think I would, um, you know, sit in front of someone who is a self-proclaimed white supremacist and try to, you know, use my humanity to connect with them, right? Because I think that is in and of itself um, validating 
what they're doing and me being willing to engage in that conversation. So I think there are different levels of boundaries that we all need to have and, and draw with folks who, depending on how they're coming to this work. But for the vast majority of um, family discussions that I've been a part of um, and people who are trying to connect with their families, it's been more so the context of, you know, they're making these remarks that are, that are subtly racist um, or they are not understanding the approaches uh, that we're taking to create this movement um, and having to, you know, bring them along on the journey, right? And I think not giving up on them is part of the work, I think, de again, depending on the context, if you're in an abusive family environment, like that is a different story than like you wanting to just check out of the work because you're uncomfortable um, with conflict at a dinner table, right? Those are two very different contexts. Um, and being able to just kind of step out and not engage with your family members is also a form of uh, exercising your privilege to disengage from the work that's right in front of you in your own spheres of influence. So, you know, I think there's a lot of asterisks when it comes to family dynamics, uh, but at a much broader level, I think there are ways that we can connect with one another by identifying the entry points. Um, and that's usually about understanding their context, their pain points, their traumas that are informing the way that they view the world. Yeah, I really appreciate um, what you said about getting curious about the other person's context. And I think that ties back into the storytelling, um, creating mm -hmm. that space to learn each other's stories. Um, and I love what you said about relating back to someone's lived experiences. So it's it's meaningful to them. Um, yeah, so that's something I'm also chewing on. Um, so this we're wrapping up our time now. Um, tech team, is it possible for audience members to unmute? Can you spotlight folks? So we're able to have them speak if you tell us who to unmute. Okay, great. So um, I wanted to just spend a few minutes. Um, I know all of us as a community, we've we've just loved and found your book so powerful, Michelle. And I wanted an opportunity for folks who are willing to either write in the chat or to unmute yourselves. Um, just type in the chat your name if you would like to actually say something directly to Michelle. I know she would appreciate that. And so I'm just going to give a few minutes and invite you to do that. So again, if you want to say something in the message to affirm, um, you know, Michelle and her book, um, and Dana just said you can raise your hand and we can spotlight you. And we only have a few minutes. So if you can move fairly quickly, that would be much appreciated. I know it's like 1 a.m. in some people's yeah. uh, <laughs> cities, so totally understand if you're sleepy and <laughs> barely awake. Yes. Oh, we have, yes, Annika raised her hand. Great. Wait, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, I would want to ask, what advice would you give to like a young person I guess in their early 20s who feels like they can't really do much like when everything feels like work like, where, where do I start type of thing mm, yeah thank you so much for asking that question um you know when I was in my early 20s and I was in the uh the very fun world of corporate America um I was incredibly disillusioned. I felt so jaded about any type of change being possible. I was incredibly cynical about what was possible because here I was in an environment where the organizational leaders were spewing um, their commitments to DEI. And yet the lived experiences of marginalized people in the workplace was nothing but um, incredible or inclusive. And I felt so jaded to a point where I felt like the only way that I can get through this is by not doing the work at all and disengaging so that I don't become disappointed or by being um, just super critical of everything and everyone in my way. And neither of them was, um, one, a helpful change strategy, but also I think it did a lot of harm to me that I wasn't able to have hope or faith in change. So I think a lot about um, the quote by Mariam Kaba, who is a Black abolitionist, Black woman abolitionist, who talks about hope as being a discipline and how we need to remember to practice hope, that it's not just something that's going to happen, but we have to practice having hope. 
Um, and we do that by looking around us and seeing that change is being made every single day by people who are on the ground doing the work of transforming their own spheres of influence and that we can do this together. And that even when the crushing weight of systems of oppression is just leading us to despair, what we need to remember is that it is the belief that change is possible that seeds change every single time. And I, I don't think we can do that alone. I think we have to do that in community. I think we have to remind each other of the, the worthiness of our struggles together and not expending ourselves in the name of the work. So how do we do this work without giving all of ourselves to the movement in a way that make us expendable? That is also not the way that we do this work. And again, we need community and collective reminders for that and the conditions where we don't have to burn ourselves out for this work. Um, and the the quote that I also remember is, it comes from Panda Express. <laughs> I got a fortune cookie when I was in my 20s, when I was feeling really jaded and I had Panda Express and I opened up the fortune cookie and it said, don't give in to cynicism. Um, and cynicism is, probably one of the most toxic things that we could harbor in ourselves. Um, and I also remember the stories told by Erica Huggins, who's a leader of the Black uh, Panthers movement. And she said that we need to find those stories that give us hope and hold on to them. And that remind us of the possibility of our collective humanity. Um, so I, I think about that often is what are the stories that I want to hold on to that make this journey worthwhile, not because we have to create change in other people today, but because we need to restore our faith in humanity again for our sake. Otherwise, this world is much too violent for us to exist in and recognizing that we all have our own front line, as I said in the book that we get to be showing up to every single day. So when the changes feel so big and vast, really focusing on what is within my control today and taking one step at a time, I think is the best advice I can give to anyone feeling really overwhelmed or cynical or disappointed by the lack of progress. Because what you do on a day-to-day -day basis in your own spheres of influence matters a whole lot. Thank you so much, Michelle. Unfortunately, our time is up. I know we had a lot of questions. Um, and so um, please continue to talk about Michelle's book um, and watch her website. There's a lot of exciting things going on in that space. Michelle, a lot of folks have um, typed some encouragement in the chat for you. Um, so please take a look there. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight um, or this morning, this afternoon. Um, and thank you, Michelle, for your time today. We appreciate thank you. Thank you so much. So much. Yes. And um, we look forward to seeing more of you in the international school space. Yes. Thank you, everybody, for dialing in from all over the world. I'm so honored. Thank you, all of you, for being part of the organization of this event. Um, I'm just so thrilled and honored to see that my book is being read and it's being resonated um, with so many people in this way. So thank you all for the work that you do every day and for reading my book. Thank you, everyone. Um, and team, um, Michelle wanted to take like a selfie. So we can- Oh yeah, take, let's do a yeah, selfie. Yeah, let's take on for, let's stay on for a second. Um, I, every, I'll take one and I'll send it, but someone else can also take one as well. Um, Michelle, do you, do you have something you want us to do? Mike, if you can get on the screen, that would be great. If you, okay, well, well, we'll wait for you, Mike. Um, I don't know, last time we did her, is there, is there anything you wanted us to do or just, you know, you're, you're, you're the um, center today. So you're, you're the guest. <laughs> oh yeah. My, you, we can hold up the book. Oh, that would be great. Yes. Let me get my book out. Okay. Also, everybody, please leave a review. <laughs> oh yes. Let's do that. If you haven't done it, please leave a review. Okay. Okay. So let me, hold on. Let me, all right. Okay. One, two, three. Got it. Yay. Yay. Thank you, everyone. And, Thank you, uh, everybody. Yay. And um, 
Mike, if we, um, is there a way we can get the um, chats and um, I would like to send that to Michelle. We can send her all the encouragement. Yes, absolutely. Yes, okay. I'll save that. Okay. Liz? Thanks, Michelle. You're great. Thank you so much. Thank I really appreciate y'all. This is such a heartwarming event. Thank you. This was Thank such you. an honor and a privilege to actually meet you and be able to hear um, your own words. Like, I mean, we hear them, we hear them in the book, but you <laughs> hear them as well out loud. Thank you so much. Appreciate this. Of course. Thank you for having me. Thank you again, Margaret and Joel, for bringing me to this wonderful community. Thank you. It's 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 one of hopefully many more in the future, Michelle. Yeah. So I, the last time we talk in this space. Yes, um, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, everyone.